Hi everyone, so I've got a, a PowerPoint and we've got a number of videos in it. So today I'm talking about painting with fire. So we're gonna be using heat patina to actually color our metal artwork. Painting with fire, how to use heat patinas to enhance your art. So we're gonna be enhancing our art with color. Traditionally, blacksmiths, we only use these colors uh, when we're making like tools or blades or um, sometimes armor, things like that, when we're trying to heat treat right? You're seeing like, okay, I need this tool to get to like a yellow or a peacock. Um, and that's where it stops. Um, but here we're going to challenge our thinking and use these colors for art. We're thinking differently to enhance our designs. And this opens up a completely new world um, of color and uh, expression. So whoop, here we go. So here we can see I'm going to be doing this one. Um, this is a live uh, uh, time. So you'll see here just how fast we can heat this up. This is in 20 gauge steel. I don't remember what the millimeters is for this, uh, for international, but you can see here, I'm taking my torch away to heat select areas. I'm trying to get it to the temperature that I want it to be at. Um, so I'm hitting it, bringing my torch away, letting it bloom into the color that we want it to be. So this is just a little quick example of what we're going to be talking about here. You can see we're getting, we're letting the heat run into that horn to get the dragon's horn to a nice yellow color. Um, adjusting our, thing, our pliers. One thing you want to make sure is you wear gloves and uh, preferably long sleeve shirts when you're doing this. I uh, speak from experience, you don't want to set a piece of um, metal down and then accidentally put your arm on it because it's stuck, but it's still like 700 degrees, you know. <laughs> um, so there you can see now we've got a nice blue dragon and I'm going in and just hitting that little bottom part with the torch just a tiny bit to get it to that nice golden color. Right, you see how fast that was? like a minute, minute, 30 seconds. So what is a heat patina? It's an oxide layer that forms on the surface of steel as it heats up to various temperatures. And we know if we go too far, it goes to black. That's why we call blacksmiths in English because the metal is black and we're done with it. Um, but in these in-between stages, we can get these nice colors. Um, so how can we use this? One, like we discussed before, we can temper our metal to make it harder or softer. Um, and we can add color to our metal artwork. So here's our temper chart. So um, this one, you can see that that's just our full um, from light straw all the way to our forging temperatures and to um, like forge welding. And on the left is a picture of just the colors that you'll get with torches. Um, so we can see there, we've got this nice, variation of color here. So we've got our Fahrenheit and our Celsius. So in this, we're working in the like 600, 700 degree range. Well, you know, from like 400 to 600 with uh, Fahrenheit or 200 to 350 um, Celsius. So tools, what we need for this are actually really simple. You need a heat source. Uh, you can say, if you wanna make a homogenous color, you can stick it in the oven, heat it up to a certain temperature or on your barbecue. Um, I like to use a little propane torch. Um, that way you, you can also use oxycetylene torch. You want a torch for your fine control. Um, grinder or a sander, uh, some way to make your metal uh, polished and shiny. Oops. <laughs> we don't wanna get burnt. Right, I know a lot of blacksmiths like, I don't need gloves, you know, but um, for this, since we're gonna be holding and manipulating the metal more, um, wear them. You can use Sharpies uh, as a nice resist and protective coating for um, when you've done your patina. So grinding, you can see this is uh, before and this is after. So you see all these textures and grinding adds to our metal. We can do this to add in shapes, designs, 
And we want this nice shiny texture so that the colors appear better. So with grinding, we achieve a polished surface. You can create, you can basically like draw with it to create a paint-like texture. You can do freeform, and way less cleanup. And it's a lot cheaper to have a grinder, like an angle grinder, than to have a sandblaster. With sandblasting, you have a rough matte texture. Um, if you're trying to make a design that you don't want overspray, you have to use stencils. There's a lot more cleanup afterwards before you can paint or do your fire um, coloring. You have to have a good air compressor for it and it's more expensive to have and to run. So the grinder, um, to add texture to it, I'm just gonna go here. So we have our angle grinder and I also love this contour sander from um, Eastwood, this is our CT contour sander. What that does is it gives me a nice um, satin finish on our steel. So you'll see we'll be going from this satin to this grinded round texture. So you just take your angle grinder and the surface thing that cut my grinding time down in half. Before I'd have to grind that entire piece of steel with an angle grinder and that took me like half an hour per um, DM screen. And this took me 15 minutes. Um, so here you can see I'm using the angle grinder to add in some smoke and fire texture. And then we're just adding some nice like little clouds. You know, you can be like Bob Ross, add in some happy little trees, add in some grass and fire, happy little clouds. Um, you know, you're basically like painting and drawing uh, on steel. Uh, now you can do this on forged objects, right? You forge it and then you stand it up and you can do this. So you can see we've got this nice texture there. Um, here I'm gonna show you some things here. So I'm not sure how well this is actually showing up there. So when I go to heat it, here you can see, I'm just using a cheap little propane torch that I get from the hardware store. And there I'm, marking so that I can see where these pieces meet up. So you can continue the same picture across multiple pieces of steel. Um, just, you know, do a little bit of layout. Um, and so this process takes about 45 minutes or so. So we'll do that around there then just add some, that so you can see over that I've made it so that it matches up perfectly. Um, with just like mannequins with little marks with my Sharpie. You see that texture that that um, adding those grinding marks is in does? All right, so then we're just, that's a touch. And then here we can see one of the cool things that does this from both sides at the same time. So here you can see from the back, as I heat the steel, it does the front and the back at the same time. So you're getting multiple layers um, of the uh, uh, paint. Well, paint. All right, so we can use resists. So what are resists? We're gonna be using some form of material to stop an area from changing color or to make it change color at a different rate. So we can use this to block off an area uh, from changing color completely or to add extra design elements. Um, so one easy way to do this is Sharpie. You can just draw on the steel before you um, torch it. Uh, so you can add design elements. You can see here um, on the left, this was the before, and on the right is after. So you can see that the Sharpie lines uh, change a completely different color than the base metal did. Um, so you can you know, add sketch elements to your pieces. You wanna add like, hash chat, you know, shading, uh, leave secret messages somewhere. Um, that is something that you can do. Another thing we can use is the Eastwood anti-heat compound. I got this recently to try out and it is amazing. If you're doing any welding or anything like that, also a great thing to do. Um, let me see here, I got some chat questions. So um, here we're gonna put it all together. 
And here we go. So I made this one loading. So here you can see I'm adding in just some Sharpie designs on this octopus that I cut out. And here's the heat compound. It's just sort of like putty that you can uh, mix with water. It will completely block it. You can see on this octopus, I recorded a bunch that was uh, actually not recording. Um, but I wanted to have those little spots to make it like a ringed octopus. So I put these little dollops of it on there. You can see there, we got that. And we have a nice little secret surprise on the back, making use of doing both sides. So we can see here, we have this side. We've done just our grinder marks on it. But on the other side, I use Sharpie to do more resist. So we can use this uh, in a lot of different ways, right? Do, 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 do. So issues, pros and cons of stainless steel. Stainless steel is rust resistant. You can get some really amazing colors out of it. The cons are you need a mirror polish for it to like really pop and really shine. It warps like crazy one of the reasons why it's so hard to uh, weld stainless steel, where you get a lot of real, if you can weld two inch 6G pipe, you are in the money. Um, and it's more expensive to get stainless than mild. So most of my work is all done with mild steel. So here you can see on the left, this was some of these colors on the polished bottom of this flask. And on the right was some of the colors I got with just a torch. You can see the difference in the vibrance between our satin finish and our mirror polish finish. Um, copper is another one that you can do lots of really great um, patina and color with. I haven't worked with it a lot um, in this form. Um, so I need to do a lot more experimentation with that. Pros of copper, you have a different color range. So there's a lot of different colors you can do. Um, it's easier to work. It's a lot softer. So if you're forming your copper into things before you do your heat patina, it's way nicer and easier to use than steel. Um, Rose, it's more expensive than steel. So you can charge your clients more money because they're like, ooh, it's copper. Um, cons, it's harder to get the colors you want um, because it is such a good heat conductor. So it's way easier to accidentally blow what you were working on out. Um, colors disappear easier with the protective coating. And another con is it's more expensive than steel. <laughs> you know, it's a pro and a con because you still got to buy your materials to make your thing. Um, here's some examples of what people have done just using the heat patina with copper. You see you can get these amazing designs and colors. I'm not at that level with copper. <laughs> Um, uh, one of the issues with steel and doing this in general, they become potato chips that we don't want to eat. Um, so when you're heating up your metal, especially if you're heating up over here, heating up over there, making your metal heat tra travel in different ways, your metal is going to warp in different ways. So what it does is it can get complex curves in it. So it curves in multiple directions the same time. Um, I've come up with a couple ways to fix warps. First one, using a dead blow mallet. Second one, using a slip roller to basically roll it in the opposite direction of the curve that you've got into it. So we're doing the opposite of what a slip roller is for. Instead of making something round, we're making something flat. Um, and the really simple one of using your knees or like the edge of a bench. Um, also potentially a hydraulic press. So here, we're going to do this real quick. <clears throat> so you can see in this one, oh, no, stay there. So you can see that warp that I got that. So first method, protect it with paper, hit it with a dead blow mallet like a million times. Here I'm using the slip roll, roll it through a bunch of times. This one is way faster than that. And then, you know, give us some adjusts, the old, the old percussion treatment. 
right? And so there we just use our little knee um, to just give it a couple tweaks. But you see there I'm having to do it in multiple directions. So that is a fun, well, I wouldn't say fun. It is one of the necessary things if you're not trying to make your thing in a complicated shape. Uh, with a mild steel, number one advice, don't touch it with your bare hands. Um, always wear gloves after you've cleaned it, you've polished it, wear gloves. If you do touch it with your hands, immediately take those oils off because it will rust and you will get fingerprints in your patina. Um, and paint it or protect it as soon as you can after uh, you patina it because it will rust. Uh, so sometimes what I'll use if I'm not gonna be painting the whole thing uh, quickly is I will use a, a welding spray, a spatter spray, and I'll just coat it with that. Coat it with some oil, WD-40, something to keep it rusting. Now you can use rust to really interesting effects. You can see on this piece here, I had it rusted and then I put it in some evapo rust to get that rust off, but it still left this interesting texture uh, after I put the heat patina on it. So you can play around with rusting and grinding to get cool textures and uh, colors. Uh, paint issues. Clear coats can extremely, like, vastly change your colors. So, um, you have to do some experimentation to see what clear coat works best for your steel. Uh, make sure your steel is clean before you paint it. Usually use some tacky uh, painting um, like cloth to get all the little dust bits off. And adding more layers or less layers uh, can change your the color that's coming through because the oxide layer is reacting with the light. So here we can do, see I did a little test piece. So at the top we have a matte spray paint, then we have a semi-gloss, a gloss, and then my favorite, this, these are all uh, Rust-Oleum products. This is a crystal clear gloss. And here you can see these three are crystal clear. This is done with a 120 grit flat disc on an angle grinder. This is sandblasted. And then this is a satin finish done with the contour sander. So you can see the difference that sandblasting makes with your metal. So if you are trying to do this on a piece that you forge, you will need to somehow polish it to really get these colors to pop. Um, here we can see it in action. You can really see that difference we get. Um, especially with that sandblasted look. So here are some examples of using it on other things. These are some shields from the Legend of Zelda I make. Right. So that one, you can really see how the colors pop in the sunlight. Here's some copper with paint on it. With copper, one of the issues is you lose a lot of the pinks when you, um, uh, you you uh your clear coat. Uh, you can do etching. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can etch your steel after you blew it to make the etchings really pop. I do this a lot for uh, customers where they want something etched into their dungeon master screen, and I use just a saltwater etch. So electricity and saltwater etch these afterwards. Um, so you can see that nice color we get going through that. Um, I also use this on the dragon sundial I did for the um, event, what was that, 2020 or 2021? So I did a little sheep duty down there. Um, and then I did a little house on fire, you know, for this nice dragon coming over to terrorize the village. So sheep is in the breakfast, morning time. By the end of the day, the dragon's tired and it's just gonna, you know, burn the town down. Um, so experiments I want to try. Uh, I want to try making a frame to see if I can minimize the warpage that I get from doing the steel. I wanna try doing an induction forge 
I'm using a little mini pancake wand. See if I can use that to really control um, the area that we're heating up and get a finer control on it than I can with a blowtorch. Um, powder coat. So powder coat is a really strong coating that you uh, use uh, compressed air and electrostatic to add onto your steel or, or your metal various different metals as long as it's conductive or you heat it up beforehand. Different powder coats will give you different effects. You can really, if you use the wrong color, you can really mute um, the color of your steel. Um, so I wanna try different powder coats. Uh, I wanna try using some different paints if we can get some interesting effects. And using tumbler with polishing compound to uh, polish forged parts like roses and then heat color them. Um, an artist that would be great to check out is uh, Jeffrey H. Dean. Um, he does these amazing pieces where he grinds them and he does the heat patina. Um, I think I accidentally missed a picture. Here we go. I did want to show you this as an example of what using the wrong spray paint, how it can completely change color, right? So this is the before is here on the left, and the after is on the right, much duller um, and much darker. So that one I grabbed a different gloss, and not my crystal clear. So if you use the wrong um, color, it can really uh, mess up your piece. Then you have to remove all that paint and paint it again. Pain in the ass. Um, all right, so the wrap up, I hope with this presentation, we can challenge the traditional thinking of just using this as a means to see how hard or how soft our metal is, right? We learn a new way to make art. Uh, good idea to try out different materials and the most important part, have fun playing with fire, right? <laughs> question comes from Mariano Garabato and this do you use something like a 400 grinding disc yeah so um usually with my steel I just go buy cheap uh, flap discs from um honestly I go to Harbor Freight so in the U.S. we have a nice cheap wood for most things um uh cool store called Harbor Freight and so I just bet my little like flap discs are what I recommend. They're really great. So I usually do 60 grit to 120 grit with that. Um, you can get up to mirror polish. I've made bass mirrors before. And, you know, you go up to 2000 grit uh, and you can get some really cool looking stuff with that. Um, I haven't put in the effort to do that yet. <laughs> um, not with this. Uh do you want to try getting some um, air sander tools? Because you can do uh, some different effects with that that I've seen people use. So the ne next is rather a comment also from Marianne. Here in Denmark, Denmark, for example, you can find some cheap copper from roofs and walls because people use a lot in old houses. Fantastic. That's a great source. Or if you have people that do make copper roofs, you can get like scrap from them. So usually you can get it cheaper. Um, I found a uh, metal supply place in San Jose, like uh, 45 minutes away from me. They uh, they get all scrap copper and brass and aluminum from uh, their jobs they're using too much or people places that are going out of business and they sell it by the pound. And the last one, did you try to paint with oil? There is some good designs that come to mind with the mistake. I haven't tried to paint with oil yet. Um, and really thought of it. Also, you're running into flammable issues there <laughs> um, because you're using a torch on it. So depending on the smoke point of your oil, that's now going to be on fire and possibly falling onto your work. Um, but you could definitely use um, oil and then like salt and vinegar to rust specific areas and get some like interesting texture. Also, if you have like other patina on it, then you torch it, you'll get some different colors. I am wary of doing that because I don't know what kind of toxic fumes it might be getting off. Oh, so salt water etching technique. 
Um, I have a power supply. You can do this with also batteries or um, a DC's power supply, AC power supply, or a battery charger that's not a smart battery charger. Um, you basically hook up one end of your alligator clamps to your steel. The other one, you have a piece of metal. I have one that's got a wooden handle, piece of metal, and then I put um, either paper towels or felt on it. You just dip it in salt water and you put it on the steel and it touches it. So I do uh, vinyl masks and get those great designs. You want to make sure, though, that you scrub it with um, like Windex or something afterwards so it stops rusting. Okay. Yes. Hey, uh, I, I hope, ben Benjamin, this answers your question enough or is there further need for further elaboration? The next question comes from Carol. What brand is the Crystal Clear you are using? So it's uh, Rust-Oleum Crystal Clear. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what equivalents there would be in other countries. Um, so it just... You, like what I did was I, you saw there, I did a piece of steel and I did it so it had all the same colors. And I did some side-by-side -side paint. Um, so that way you can see the difference between them. And like one coat, two coats, three coats, I can all change what the colors look like. Next question is from Paul. Is your technique weatherproof to use in an architecture for a long time inside and outside the building? So um, as long as it's protected from rust, it will be. Um, you know, if you have copper, you do your heat patina on copper, but then you don't put any protection on it. No, you can also use like waxes to keep it from rusting, right? Or to keep it from changing. You put, you know, you put the copper out in the weather, no matter what type of color you have on it, eventually it's going to go green, right? Um, unless you put either a wax or a clear coat, powder coat, something like that on it. Well, question well, I have one from... question. Do, uh, do the colors remain also in sun heat? Uh, yeah. Okay. Unless you get that temperature up to, you know, 200 degrees, 500 degrees, 700 degrees, they're not going to change. Uh, they're going to okay. stay there. I do recommend that, you know, if you're using mild steel that you keep it inside because if your coating gets scratched and it's left outside you'll have little parts that rust I had that happen mm -hmm. to a couple of my pieces where i got a little rough with them um and so they had some spots of rust which are a pain to go back and try <laughs> so the next question comes from ale and has been asked in spanish but mariano was so kind to already translate it which uh, and it translates to how do you protect the colors from rusting or the weather? So that is again, adding a protective clear coat. If I'm doing an exterior thing that's gonna want to like really hold up like a railing, I will I would try and experiment with some powder coats just because you've got much tougher protection um, and probably less likely to change color. Um, now I have only been doing this for the last like three years. I can't say for certain how long, you know, 10 years down the line, if the colors are still going to be there, if it's outside the weather, even with a protective coating. Uh, but I know inside, it definitely holds. Hmm. Okay. And I see now that you think you could use a TIG welder to draw that, and you absolutely could. So you can use a TIG welder and use that to heat it. I also use a MIG welder sometimes if I want to put little polka dots on something. I'll use a MIG welder and I'll just do little tacks and that will come through the other side and give me a nice circle that's multiple colors. Um, I make a lot of like plasma cut grateful dead bears and that's one of the options I do like a polka dot one. Actually I do have a really good example piece. Um, so we can see here this is the back of one of my DM screens, and this is in the sun. And you can see how these colors change and pop in the sunlight. Um, so this, again, is just mild steel. Everyone always asks me if I'm using, um, uh, you know, am I using stainless? And everyone's always super surprised that it's just mild. I have a question, which is, 
Uh, I have you, you know, always had it just in the, um, like in the open, like with no backing behind it, like, like some kind of heat store, heat, heating up stone or something. Would this give some benefits if one would have some trouble? Yeah, so if, um, for instance, say you're welding stainless steel, if you have a large piece of aluminum to act as a heat sink, that helps draw the heat away and make it um, increase the warpage. So there's a possibility if you had a large enough piece of say aluminum, you were like attached to and were um, using the heat on, it might reduce the warpage, but it would take longer to get the colors that you're looking for. Um, so it's something to experiment with. Um, I have a massive piece of aluminum, but it's, sort of um, too massive to move a piece of aluminum. So if I had a uh, course that did more better with holding upside down like that, like if I got a oxyacetylene or oxypropane torch, um, that'd be an easy uh, experiment to try. Okay. Um, it might, you know, just spitballing, it might affect the color on the back of it. Uh, not 100% sure. Mariano has added the comment, I'm a stainless steel welder and we use a lot the aluminium behind. It works great. Yeah, it's, it's a tip I, I, I got in welding class and I was like, that is that I will keep. <laughs> um, oh, the, <clears throat> uh, that uh, heat compound, the Eastwood anti-heat compound, also amazing for welding. Um, I put that on there and there was no heat going within like uh I'd say like a eighth inch, a quarter inch of where I put the heat compound. So if you have to make some like emergency wells on a piece and you don't want heat traveling up there, say you've got a paint or you've got enamel or powder coat, you could put that around there and just weld that section um, and the heat won't travel. It says it's good up to 3000 degrees. Um, so one reason, one thing I'm going to play around with it is making uh, faces. So if I do a person, you can say like, okay, I want to have hair this color. You can block off that, that is the color you want, and coat it with the anti-heat compound, move on to another section. Um, so use that to make sure your colors and heats don't bleed from one to another. But also like amazing if you're doing welding or touch-ups. From Mariano, do you think you can use also in the oven like blocking colors when you get it? I think so. Um, the only trick is getting your oven to go up high enough, right? <laughs> um, so it might be better on a barbecue where you can really crank up the forge or in a forge. You know, things to try. I got it, I got it last week, so still experimenting with it. Next question from Becky. How are you assembling your pieces without damaging the painted colors? So a lot of my pieces, not for keeping the color safe, well, a little bit. Either I'll weld it in a spot where I can touch it up or that won't be seen, or I use the chemical adhesives. Um, JB Weld It <laughs> uh, is what I do with a lot of the pieces um, because especially when I'm working with really thin metal, you know, you drop that and those welds might just pop. So the JB Weld a lot of times will give me an actual a stronger bond and a couple little tack welds will. So it's a combination of welding and um, using our friend the camera. To my mind comes immediately the next question. Do you use rivets or is there a reason why one should not use rivets in that case? You can absolutely use rivets. Um, I'm working on a design for a dungeon master screen. So the things with the dragons on them are a dungeon master screens for dungeons and dragons. Um, so I'm working on a design for ones where I'll rivet everything together. Um, for that particular design, since it has the castles with a multi-layer, um, I weld those on so that I don't have to do all my holes and get everything to match up and then cut my hinges to the right size to match up the correct things. Because I get my hinges in like eight foot lengths and then I cut them to size. So... For I mean, although for the ones that I'm working on, the rivet will be a lot easier than welding because thing that line up and then match up perfectly <laughs> when you get it closed, 
be the pain. <laughs> but what I really like about those ones is that you have that color on the outside and on the inside. So the people that are behind the screens also have this nice um, color. The uh, next question, again from Ale, kindly translated by Mariano. Now, how can you accelerate the copper oxidization or get the faster oxidation? Um, so um, I can't remember 100% with copper. Um, do you mean for the, the color oxidation or like having it outside and getting that nice verdigris patina? Um, you can to accelerate most things with copper, brass, steel, if you do uh, salt water and vinegar. Um, if you want to get that nice, like, aged, weathered look, that's really easy to do. Um, otherwise, if you're just trying to, like, heat it up with copper, it heats up super fast because it is a great conductor of heat. That's why we use it for electricity. That's why it's in wires for conducting um, everything, why, you put, like, copper bowls and stuff are really great at conducting heat. Um, but it does make it easier for you have a heat in this section, you've got it really nice color and you're heating over here and suddenly that changes because the heat travels. Um, maybe using the anti-heat compound might be able to mitigate that. I haven't tried to uncover it yet. Um, and as with everything, you can also preheat your pieces. If I'm working in the winter, um, I'll have it, I'll just put my pieces on top of my little space heater that I have in my workshop and then so that they preheat before I and with my torch. And there can be a lot of moisture that accumulates on your piece, like on your seal that you don't realize until you hit it with a torch and you can see moisture coming off of it. Um, and depending on how you dry that as you hit it with your torch, you can get different colors and textures from the water. So if you have water on your piece and you heat it up, that will affect the heat patina that you get. Mm -hmm. Just something to, so sometimes I will just like go and preheat the entire piece so that I don't get extra like wavy lines and stuff. Sometimes I leave it because I want that. Thanks a lot, Anna, for giving this today's draft presentation. It's been a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and I think everyone else too. There has come a comment from Paul, interesting technique of coloring. You learned to us, nice presentation. Thanks a lot.